It's been over a year now since we wrote our first book, The Shit They Never Taught You. A uh, lot of fun writing it and, uh, mate, looking back retrospectively, uh, we've been getting some phenomenal feedback from those who have been buying the book and it's been quite impactful for everyone. We've got a great one here from Al Bortz A. Nice summary of lots of books. If you are a nonfiction reader, this book can actually help you to better shape the overall understanding of your mindset. It's like the final touches on a vase during pottery. It doesn't create the main shape, but it smooths the edges. It can also help in creating some connections between different books which weren't possible before. But again, to make that main mindset structure, books need to be read and get reflected on. No one gets fit watching an exercise videos. That's a Jeez, that pretty man. deep. Where, um, that was super where deep. Where was that review? I've never it was Al Bortz. Where was it? Do you know where it was That was on, on the Amazon? audiobook, yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks, yeah. Al. That was one of my favorite, favorite <laughs> reviews so far. I like the deepness of the, the pottery vase, not creating the shape, but you're smoothing out the edges, creating connect. Incredible. <laughs> well, if you want to create a, a vase full of connections and pottery of knowledge, then uh, this book, of course, is for you, The Shit They Never Taught You. So if you want to get it for yourself, you can get the written version or the audio version. Head to theshittheyneveretaughtyou.com. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Changing World Order by Ray Dalio, Why Nations Succeed and Fail. The times ahead will be radically different from anything we've experienced in our lifetimes, but pretty similar to other times throughout history. Pretty big call, but how does Ray know that? and How does he think that? Well, he's a pretty big dog investor. We covered his other book, uh, uh, Principles, and he's, uh, he's quite multidisciplinary with how he looks at things. Because over the last 50 years, he's had to really try and understand the most important factors that goes into making countries and financial markets succeed and fail and obviously make big bets on the future to make money. Yeah, he's learned to anticipate and handle situations that he has never seen before. To do that, he had to study many analogous historical cases to find out kind of what happened and uh, I guess how we can make money out of it, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, so what he's seen, like that uh, there's been a whole bunch of things that he hadn't personally seen before in his lifetime, but the same thing happens over and over and over in history. Yeah, so it happened and he gets surprised and then he looked through the history books and goes, geez, it's another one of <laughs> those. happened. <laughs> right? So, it's happened a lot of times where there's been huge debt and uh, high interest rates which lead to massive money printing in uh, world currencies, which seems like a unique thing today, right? But um, over the last three or four years, but it's happened many times in the past. You know, similarly, you've got big political and social conflicts within a country due to wealth, political or values gaps. Uh, and again, similarly, you don't have to look far to realize that that's kind of been on the rise in the last decade or so and ramping up even more so recently. And even thirdly, so a rising new power to come and challenge the existing world power and existing world order, a bit like China challenging the US today. Well, he wrote this book last year before all the shit that went down this year. He was probably licking his lips in the sense mm. that I told you so uh, because be a bit of the conflict of what happened with Russia and China and how the world's sort of breaking up and the uh, increasing conflict. I mean, 12 months ago when he released this book, I'd be like, nah, that's, uh, there's no conflict coming. Mm. But it's just another one of those according to Ray. He yeah, saw it coming. Right. The last time he said that he saw the confluence of all these things, huge debts, zero interest rates, big political and social divides across the world, rising um, uh, new power to challenge the existing world order. So the last time he saw that was between 1930 to 1945, so be before any of our time. And we know what happened there. Great Depression followed by World War II. Well, it's actually probably the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not a positive thing, man. Not at all. We're, he's saying we're going to be in that. We're most likely 1930 to 1945. A lot of bad things happened there. But really, all the empires and dynasties that he has studied and uh, declined, they follow a classic big cycle. And he's got clear um, markers that allow us to see where we're sitting in that cycle, if we're at the beginning, middle, or end. And it really produces big swings between peace and prosperous periods of, of history and you've got great creativity and productivity and living standards to the dark side, Astro, where you've got depression, revolution, war, a lot of fighting over wealth and power and destruction of wealth and life and everyone dying and shit going down, really. That's right. He says that we're always swinging between those two extremes and obviously a lot of time we're somewhere in between. We probably haven't felt it in our lifetime, but it definitely that's the, the arc of history. And the thing is when those cycles align, when someone's swinging towards a depression, revolution, war, and someone else is swinging towards a peace, prosperity, creativity, productivity, when those things align, 
there's these tectonic plates of history that are shifting. He says the lives of all people change in big ways. And he says this swinging, it's, uh, it's the norm. It's not the exception. And the, the swing, it actually happens in over periods of centuries, right? So it's, uh, it's very rare that a country in a century doesn't have one huge big boom and huge bust mm. period and a harmonious period. But we as individuals, we look through history and the future or we look th- to the future as if it's like a slightly modified mm. version of the past because because these big events occur one in 100 years. Um, it's what the, the baby boomers, like my grandma, I'm just speaking to her recently, she was six years old in the Second World War, right? So when she um, passes away, you know, the, everyone around now has totally forgotten how mm. bad and horrible war is and that probably makes it more likely that it's going to occur because mm. everyone with the living memory is gone. And so it happens in these 100-year cycles. Yeah, that's right. We expect that all we know is what's happened in the last 5, 10, 20 years, depending on how long you've been around. You think the future is going to be pretty similar to that. As you say, if you get what happened, uh, if you go a little bit back further in, in history in that swing, that pendulum, it's swinging back around and uh, it could be coming for us soon. So anyone who studies history can see that there's no system of government, no currency, no economic system, no empire. It just doesn't last forever. And yet we're always super surprised when they fail. So in this episode, we're going to actually cover the different case studies from the past and how they've gone through a rise, a a point at the top, and then finally a fall. And Ray's really smartly actually put metrics and things to actually measure this progress up the hill and actually down the hill. And he's laid it out into different determinants of this. So the main ones are uh, education, so how well educated the population is, the competitiveness with others, the amount of innovation and technology, the ability for free trade, economic output, your military strength, um, your financial center status, and the reserve currency status. So when he judges the strength of a country in the book, it's actually through these factors. He noticed that the rise phase tends to begin where there's you know strong enough and capable enough leadership to gain power. And then once they're in power, they design an excellent system to increase a country's wealth and power. And this generally involves strong education, strong character, strong work ethic. Um, they're typically taught in schools and religious institutions. There's a healthy respect for law and there's low corruption. Yeah, so the more of this sort of stuff they have at the beginning, the more the country is going to move from producing just basic stuff that the world's seen before in history to actually innovating and inventing the next round of technologies that are going to change the world. Like we're going to speak about a few dynasties here, but for as an example, um, the Dutch at their peak had a quarter of all of the inventions in the world. Now, if you're getting a quarter of all the inventions in the world, Asher, you're probably going to be a bit of a power, aren't you? That's a lot, especially if you think... You know, you're one out of 200 countries or so and you're making up 25% of inventions. That's that's some pretty powerful stuff. They uh, invented ships so they could travel the world. They also invented capitalism as well. So, they've, they've invented a couple of big things. So, as a result of these innovations, a country becomes more productive. So, at the beginning, then they become more competitive in the world markets and their share of world trade is rising. And then as they expand, they start to protect its trade routes and foreign interests and, and defend itself from attack. So it actually grows its military strength, another one of those factors we mentioned. So if this is done well, if all these the right pieces of the puzzle are put together, they're all in place, then this cycle, this rise phase, you can start to see strong income growth. Um, you see investments in infrastructure, education, research, development. And as a country develops systems to incentivize uh, and empower those to make great wealth. So on its way up to the top, it also develops its capital markets. So as it expands its international dealings, um, what happens, the transactions begin to be paid in its own currency because everyone's, you know, they're, they're the ones with all the innovation. So everyone's paying that country for the innovations, the money is flowing to them. Now, if your country B, you're better off holding your money in their currency because you can trade with two other countries that aren't, you know, the leading country because everyone just sees them as the power. So obviously a bit like the US dollar today, but, you know, the US dollar wasn't always a reserve currency. It's always the the country that's actually rising and, and currently at the top. That's right. If someone comes to you today in 2022 and says, hey, can I buy this off you? Here's, Indonesian here's, here's, rupiah. here's, 100, here's 100 US dollars. You say, yeah, sure. Yeah. Indonesian rupiah, Papua New Guinea, Kina. They're probably not really accepted all around the world. Whereas the US dollar, anyone will take it. So what happens on the way up when it does have that reserve currency status where everyone's trading through your own currency, it means you can go out there and borrow a lot more with lower rates than other countries. 
because there's a lot more actual cash floating around the world to dilute what you're actually borrowing in. So, there's a good period where you can get away with that, that <laughs> funny stuff. Just, bo- just borrow like the US is today, I guess. <laughs> it sounds like a good place to be. But then, of course, you get to the top. So, in the top phase, a country sustains the success that fueled its rise. As people in the country have now sort of become rich and powerful, as they've gone up and up and up, they've been able to earn more. They're more expensive and less competitive relative to other people in other countries who are willing to probably work harder for less. Yeah, that's it. So, for example, when the the Dutch were at their top, they hired the British shipbuilders who were much cheaper, the expensive labor to come in and, and build the ships for them. So, you know, a bit like today, like uh, in Australia, it's a totally different story if you're hiring someone here or you're actually outsourcing a lot of the work overseas. Number one, you're going to get them for a cheaper price, right? Mm-hmm. And number two, they're probably going to be a bit hungry and then maybe they're going to do a better job. For sure. Um, you, can, you can definitely see that happening at the top. Yeah, as, so as people in this leading country become richer, they're not working as hard, they enjoy more leisure, they pursue finer things in life, which often means less productive, um, they become extremely decadent. So basically, when countries get to the top, their values change. And at the top, because remember, we're, we're talking about, we only think in decades, us, when we think about our maybe our parents, what they went through, and that's about it. So, we're actually increasingly bet on these good times continuing mm. going forward. We don't remember anything bad. So, we just keep borrowing money on that assumption, and that leads to financial bubbles. And with capitalist systems, these financial gains at the start, if you're borrowing more money, you're probably borrowing it off the rich people and they're lending at interest. So, increasingly, wealth gaps grow inevitably in, in these at the top of these countries. That's right. And then when there's uh, the big wealth gaps, they actually become quite self-reinforcing because the people with all the money tend to have all the power. They can influence political systems. They kind of build in advantage and privilege so that their, their children also then keep all their money and make even more money. So this sort of uh, self-reinforcing system, uh, the, the wealth gaps become even greater. Yeah, and uh, and it goes without saying that that creates a lot of conflict. And sometimes if it gets too far, these gaps, these resentments can boil into conflict. But if the, the living standards for everyone is rising at the same time, then maybe you can avoid conflict here. Because when you're at the top and uh, you were saying it's, it's good if you're the reserve currency, you can just borrow more and more and more money. The thing is, you can get a bit too far. It's pretty much inevitable. If you can do it, people are going to do it. And so the, the country at the top is going to uh, borrow more and more money. They're building up larger and larger debts with foreign lenders. The thing is, in the short term, yes, it boosts their spending power, but it's really kind of you know, weakening them over the long term. They're becoming much more fragile the more they borrow. You sort of forget that you have to pay it back, don't you? At <laughs> Definitely. The, at the public level. <laughs> so you just get the you get the personal loan, and then you get the credit card to pay off the personal loan, and then you get the mortgage to pay off the credit card. Oh and then- <laughs> yeah, of course you do. But in the short term, it feels like you're killing it, right? And that's uh, countries are pretty analogous to an individual in that sense because you're borrowing and, and uh, you, you've got the nice car and the mortgage and everything like that. But eventually, things are going to come home to roost, mm. and uh, as, as you could imagine, then this is. Perhaps the decline inevitably is going to come. If you're assuming the good times are going to last forever and you're borrowing more and more money as a reserve currency status because of that. So, obviously, you realize if the rich countries keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, who are they borrowing from? They've got to borrow from the, the poorer countries who are saving more because they're, you know, they're not as decadently spending and buying the Lambos and buying the beachfront properties and stuff. Well, you're buying your stuff off the poorer countries because they're yeah. the ones... Because they're working harder and doing it cheaper, so you're shipping all the work off to them, and then you're buying the stuff off them, and then you borrow money off them to buy it off them, <laughs> and they're saving. And they're saving. <laughs> so right. you can see how that just makes yeah. uh, makes a uh, makes a cycle just in that. So you can kind of you can kind of see here the the first warning signs that the strength uh, of the empire at the top is beginning to decline. So this is where we're going to start the decline. So the debts have at some point they come really really large, and then there's an economic downturn. And then when things start, everyone assuming it's going to keep going on good forever and then things turn to shit unexpectedly, all of a sudden the empire may not be able to borrow money to repay its debts what it's had previously and maybe other countries aren't going to, they might stop lending money because they can clearly see that these, hey, these guys are on the decline now. <laughs> That's right. Not lend money. That's like when the, when the bank sees that you got six credit cards, three personal loans, a car loan, they think, okay, we're not going to give you any more money now. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is what happens at the country level when they realize that the, the country in power has got so much debt, you got to realize, hang on. Maybe I'm not going to get my money back, so I'm going to cut you. I'm going to turn off the tap. So you got two options now as a, the previously leading country. 
number one, you can cut all your spending back. You can do it really hard. You can um, sell everything you've got and just live frugally as possible as you as you can. Or option two is you print as much money as you possibly <laughs> can, um, and to make you know the, the the your debt seem seem less. But that doesn't come without its own consequences. It means you're going to devalue your own currency and surprise, surprise, uh, raise inflation if, uh, if that rings any bell for anyone listening today. <laughs> That's right. And if, you know, if you're a leader in a country and you've got option one is default on your debts and, and cut spending and do it really tough. All or, the public or, programs. We're not going to help yeah. the homeless. We're not going to do all that. <laughs> or option two is let's just print a bunch of fake money and, and just give and it use out. it to pay it off and, you know. Oh, think, politically, I think they're going to take option two. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, at the top now, there's all sorts of other problems. We mentioned um, inequality, that there's large um, gaps in wealth. There's actually, coincidentally, large gaps in values and political gaps at the same time. And at the same time, there's going to be great increases, internal conflicts between the rich and the poor, ethnic, religious, racial, political groups, um, which leads to political extremism from both ends because... We're, we've had a lot of fun previously. Our parents mm. and grandparents had a lot of fun. Why are we dealing with all this shit? And that's the, the thoughts going everywhere and everyone's um, pointing at each other, right? That's right. And this often leads to political extremism. You've got populism on the left or the right. Uh, the left, they want to uh, seek redistribution of wealth. And then those on the right are saying, no, we want to maintain order. We've got all the wealth. We want to keep, we want to keep the wealth where it is. And so you've got this big internal struggle here within a country. So typically during these times, the taxes on the rich rise, but as the taxes on the rich rise, they want to get out of the country mm. and get all their assets away from that and out of the hands of the, the fallen country because they see the writings on, on the wall. So all these things undermine productivity and shrink the uh, economic pie and things are getting worse. So this is where populist leaders emerge from both sides. And if we think about our old friends in 1930, 1945, you don't have to think very hard of what populist leaders emerge then or even the populist leaders who have emerged in our recent history and are still continuing to emerge. And as these conflicts within a country escalate, at least to some kind of um, revolution, and obviously on the extreme end, maybe a, a civil war to try to redistribute the wealth or force these big changes, it can be peaceful <laughs> or it can just erupt uh, into, into something much more violent. And obviously these civil revolutions eventually, hopefully on the other side, lead to some kind of new internal order. Well, I'm now, not, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. well, that's that, that's it. So internally, that you're dealing with a lot of stuff there, aren't you? There's a lot of things going on, and the external countries who are maybe going on the different part of the cycle, they're licking their lips at this mm. stage because they're seeing that country at the top beginning to demise, and they've gone through their own fights and shit, and uh, they're thinking, hey, how can we um, get in there and mm. challenge this existing power and the existing world order? And when this happens, of course, there's a, there's a greater chance of international conflict here. Yeah, especially once it, if there's any internal conflict going on, that's when the ones on the outside are thinking this is probably a good time to strike. Uh, and typically, the international opponent, they're going to try to exploit this domestic weakness, especially if they're kind of risen to the point where they're somewhat comparable militarily. They're going to think now is probably a good time to strike. So defending oneself against foreign rivals, it requires a lot a greater increase in military spending at the same time with money they actually don't have. So, That's right. Um, all of these poor economic conditions cause more fighting and it's a bit of a negative feedback loop. And most of the time, unfortunately, it leads to some kind of war. And uh, remember, not every war is is uh, a hot war with um, you know everyone blowing each other up. There's other levels to get to that, including just a financial war. So during these wars, you can kind of see there's the tectonic plates, they're shifting, they're realigning. The world order is, the current world order is being questioned. There's a bit of a new reality for wealth and power. Um, and it's really, uh, if, if someone's going down and someone's going up, that's really uh, the time to mark the end of this big cycle for, for the country that was previously in power. So now we're going to take the, the framework what we've just spoken about and... Uh, thanks to Big Ray, um, and go through history and see how it's actually happened. So the place we're going to start is the rise of the Dutch Empire. And we're going to pick it up for, remember, the Spanish Empire. They went to the, the, new, the new World in 1492 and they were kicking ass then. But then the, the Dutch came in after that. So we're going to start with their rise. That's right. There was a, the 80 Years War. I assume it must have lasted for 80-odd 80 80 odd years, thereabouts. Um, the Dutch had successfully revolted against the Spanish, led by their 
fearless leader William the Silent. What a shock! I, I remember we had there was Robert the Bruce once. I reckon that's that was great. What, that's that's a shock. I reckon this is the worst. There's like you know, there's Johnny the Lion or Thomas the Conqueror or you know, <laughs> William the Silent. I reckon. What if he, he claimed it on himself or if he fought? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you know, you're at the at the you know 1581 pub and you hear someone over talking about oh the William the Silent. <laughs> that's a shock. Oh, come nickname. on, guys. That's a shocking thing. But he did well. He managed to knock off the done. Spanish. Uh, the Spanish. So he got it done and. Uh, the Dutch Republic, they served their independence in 1581. There was a bit more fighting to come, I guess, to really solidify that. But the Dutch values and culture at this time then really emphasized education, saving, merit, tolerance. They wanted uh, a more inventive society. They wanted a more open society. They invented ships so they could go around the world and, and steal people's riches. It says collect riches. I feel like steal is probably what they were doing. Um, and then they had capitalism that could really finance all of these endeavors and lead to more and more breakthroughs. So at the time, they uh, were about one third of the world's trade and they actually created the world's first ever mega corporation, which is the Dutch East India Company. And, uh, and with their openness to new ideas and technologies, the levels of um, quality of life were increasing. And with that, they actually created the world's first true reserve currency other than gold and silver, and that is the Dutch Gilda. Because remember, if they're going from one country A and then they're trading with country B, um, country B will hold on to that cash now and they can trade with the rest of the world because the Dutch are running rampant everywhere and their, their currency makes sense everywhere you go. Having this, um, this first really big uh, company of the Dutch East India Company that had shareholders, that had a corporate logo, that had a board of directors. They also had the the system uh, of in put in place by the Bank of Amsterdam. Really, what these capital markets enabled people to do was they could save. Investors could save, and they could kind of make a bit of a return on their savings. Merchants could raise funds. Everyone had this liquid transfer of capital that was flowing around that was really able to fuel this new era of wealth accumulation. So the Dutch were killing it for a long while, and then inevitably they they make <laughs> made it to the top. Well, we know how top. history pans out. The Dutch That's aren't it. still the number one on the the global uh, global hierarchy, but they shifted their attentions when they were killing it to living the good life, of course, as you do in a way that weakened their finances. But then, as what happens, those peeking across sort of peeked at them and sort of laughed their heads off at them. That's right. When they got to the top, previously they had an educational and a technological edge, but that became eroded, they become uncompetitive in general. Um, also, there was the, the Dutch East India Company, which was previously killing it, was on the decline. Slower economic growth meant it was harder to pay for their empire, increased wars, made them overextended and overindebted. And really, this is kind of setting the stage for a decline to come. So, around 1750, this is when the British and the French at the time, they were beginning their rise up as the Dutch were at the very top and they became stronger and their, their newfound power, they actually challenged the great power as is typical in these cycles as and in war. Now, the financial losses and, and debts from the Dutch um, had that classic move. They started printing a lot more money. That's right. That's right. And they, they were like, okay, we're, we're losing a lot of money. We're in a lot of debt. Let's print some money to pay it off. And then eventually people realized, hang on. There's more money than there is gold because obviously at the point the point of the paper money was that you could transfer it for gold or silver at some point, but then they realized that there's more paper than there is metal uh, and so there's something doesn't add up here. And that, as is typical, so if you're like in a different country, previously it's all about the Dutch currency, but then it gets to a point like, hey, they've printed all this money. They're, mm. they're just printing it like it's nothing. It's, <laughs> this is worthless. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So then it's a negative feedback loop that they're printing more money at the same time everyone believes it's worthless. So... Um, you're going to have currency collapses, which is what happened to the Gilda. That's right. And the British came along and they thought, oh, you've got the Dutch East India Company. Well, we're going to make the British East India Company. And in terms of return on investment, the British East India Company was a far juicier. So people started selling their shares in Dutch East India and buying British East India. In order to do that, they're selling their Dutch Gilda and buying British pounds. And all of a sudden, Britain's starting to take over here. Yeah, sure. We've got a new sound system here. Do we have that sound? Wow, 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 wow. Do we actually have that? <laughs> yeah, let's. I reckon. Uh, is there something called sad or something? Sad trombone. There you go. There you go. The, no, this one. Uh, yeah. So, what <laughs> happened to the Dutch? <laughs> Mate, we've been trying to get that in at some we're point. We fin we finally now got we're, it in uh, there. So now we're under the British. <laughs> so the British are uh, on their way up now. So. Um, as according to Ray, change in the world order come when two or more countries, so you don't have to be one, you could sort of 
come as an alliance and they fight with a comparable power, kick their ass, you win, and now you've got the new world order. That's right. Britain's taken the top. <laughs> that's, it's, uh, that's that first big arc that we've seen. Someone go up, hit the top, come down, someone else is on the way up and they really take over there. So the British on the way up, they were heavily influenced by the Enlightenment thinking which occurred in the UK. So their own sort of innovation really in, in philosophy at the time. So debate and scepticism were encouraged, improvements in basic education. So they, they really valued education and investing in that. And then dissemination of ideas via print materials. So they actually, they were the ones who created the first encyclopedias and dictionaries en masse. And also the growing number of transnational elites. So the people who were really well read and understood philosophy and, and politics and, and social thought. So whilst these didn't immediately bring about prosperity, obviously they laid the foundations. Over time, the British system's respect for the rule of law combined with strong education really gave it the foundations to gain a competitive advantages in commerce and innovations that followed um, and really led to this rise of the British Empire. So one of the factors that's important for a rising country is its uh, its financial centre, um, its financial centre status of the world. So I think it was at the bank, you know, Amsterdam was where everyone traded, and um, and then around uh, 1684 the the Bank of England was created, and it actually standardised and increased the liquidity of UK government debt by bonds. So you know what's that's basically saying is that they actually could create these things, um, financial instruments called bonds, which people can buy bonds and then the government gives them an interest rate back on that, which means the government have a lot more cash to invest in spending and you know in, and take the country forward. So, bonds was a pretty big financial innovation in that sense. That's right. And because they had this well-educated population together with this culture of inventiveness plus the availability of capital to financially support these new ideas, we see the Industrial Revolution really centred in the UK around this time and they you started seeing machines doing you know effectively and efficiently doing what humans used to have to labor to do it meant that humans could kind of take a step up the rung of the ladder you know doing a bit more cognitive work a bit less of the physical labor which just leads to new inventions new ideas and really just a, a growing strong economy and on the way up with all that cash you start spending it on the, your military spending um, which is another factor of being a rising power because with that great military, you can just go around to, to different countries and sort of just ransack them, just take whatever you want, really. Um, you probably, you know, in the papers it says something different, but at the end of the day, that's what you're really doing. So you keep investing in it, and that's, of course, how the, the British Empire ended up establishing so many colonies all over the world, and it profited a lot from these expeditions. And uh, Britain obviously gets to the top. The second half of the 1800s, 60% of global trade was denominated in British pounds. They made loans to other international governments, starting with Prussia was the first one, and then a, a, a big wave of overseas borrowers followed. So basically, all this global debt, all this trade, all these capital flows, they're denominated in British currency, which really solidifies them at the top of this, of this uh, arc here. They're all over the world, the British Empire, they're doing really well up until, you know, 1950, 1914, but then there was the seeds of demise started occurring near the top. And firstly, it was declining competitiveness because the second, we had the first industrial revolution, like you said, Astro, where you've got uh, using pistons and the movement of pump and, and air to actually just do the the labor that humans previously had to do. But there was the second industrial revolution, which was all about new energy sources like petrol and electricity, which revolutionized transportation and communications and infrastructure. But the UK didn't keep up with that, uh, probably because people were just resting on their laurels a bit. That's As right. you do at the top, you're getting a bit more lazy. So you don't really keep up and you're the, you know, the creative ones coming up with these inventions. That's right. There was uh, The output per worker in the UK was slowing down whilst others were increasing around the world. Uh, another big uh, seed of their demise was a rising inequality. The top 1% owned over 70% of the wealth and the top 10% own 93% of the wealth. I mean, so that's, um, that's a lot. That's a lot. Is that worse than today? I, I would have just assumed today is the worst it's ever been for it, but that looks like it's probably worse than today even. I don't know I don't know the stats, 1%, but it, that's a lot. All over 70% of the wealth. <laughs> that's a lot. Jesus. So, as you can see, there was, a, there was a fair bit of internal tension over that. And thirdly, geopolitical rivals emerged so at the top. Everyone's licking their lips, the ones who are on the way up, and that came from France, Russia, Central Asia, and, of course, the U.S., but most significant out of all the ones on the way up was, was Germany. Yeah, Germany was, was previously a whole bunch of mini-states, but they were able to 
sort of come together. And once they were unified, um, there was that, that classic virtuous cycle of a power on the rise. They had an uh, education system that was building really from the schools, using, using schools as building from the ground up. And they were teaching practical trade skills um, at the same time as they were teaching a high level of scientific knowledge. They actually mandated primary education. It was enforced by law. It awarded grants um, to inventors and also grants to immigrant entrepreneurs. So really, Germany was building up. And in 1900, Germany's GDP surpassed Britain's. It's pretty crazy, right? So Germany were actually the probably the leader in terms of GDP for a short time. But then, obviously, the, there was a powder keg war in 1914. And uh, the victors who were comparable US, Britain, France, Japan, and Italy, they kind of just tried to throw Germany in a box. <laughs> That's right. Um, after that. They all met and said, okay, well, we're, we're going to be the big dogs. Let's get together and uh, we'll just put Germany off to the side. And they thought, okay, this is great. The Roaring Twenties came along, spending uh, big debts, wealth gaps, which obviously ended in the 1929 Great Depression. So there's probably a bit of a survivorship bias here to touch on, I think, Ash, because like, Germany were on the way up and they came back in the 1940s. If, and it's probably another whole episode, but in the Second World War, if they they could have easily won that war mm. and the whole history would be very different and maybe Germany had their control in the New World Order, but it was really, you know, in the balance there. And of course, UK and US and the Allies um, won and we got a different history because of that. That's right. Mate, and then is this what happened? What happens to Britain? Well, we don't, we done the decline yet? <laughs> yeah, I thought, they, I thought that was the decline. Oh, yeah. No. Basically, Britain just went big debts. US was on the on the way up. UK was on the way down. Um, the the huge debts of Britain were pretty expensive to maintain. In fact, more expensive than it was profitable. And you got um, like people like Gandhi doing their thing in what nineteen forty eight, <laughs> and they're not making it any easier, are they? That's right. So it took about twenty years um, after this for the British pound to lose its status as a reserve currency. Now, should we say what happened to the British? <laughs> British were done. <laughs> Game over for the British. Game over. And then of course, the US. So they're, they're the ones, the rising power now. And as with all new countries, they went through their own post revolution process and created a new domestic order in the world. So we're cutting a bit closer to, to today here, yeah. aren't we? We've got, we started in what, the 1500s? We're sort of up to now the 1900s. The US had all these things. Strong leaders fought to gain control. New leaders that had a vision that supported the population. They had a, this more sort of um, more recent new constitution. They'd set up new parts of government. They'd put people in jobs. It all worked well. Um, they had great governance from the start. After the US Civil War, they really benefited from this second industrial revolution. Gains were financed by free market capitalism. Of course, there was a bit of wealth gap that came along with it, but everyone's sort of on the way up. So during the, especially in the Second World War, remember people at the top, they're borrowing money from the people on the way up. So the British, they borrowed a lot of money from the US and then over time they had to pay it back. And I think US geopolitically had a lot of strongholds around the world because of what they um, lent to, to mm. the UK. And the really the good thing, I guess, for the US out of World War II that it wasn't really fought on US territory. So whilst... All over Europe, there's big fighting and lots of shit getting destroyed. The US is participating in the war, but none of their shit's getting destroyed. Yeah, it's like the two bullies punching on <laughs> with each other and you're the third bully just That's sort right. of just doing little pot shots and then you win <laughs> and then you come up un unscathed. It's a little bit That's like right. that. That's right. Well, they probably did a bit more than pot shots, I think, in the Second World War. But um, So the US were, were booming after the Second World War. The middle class was killing it. At first, all of their cash was tied to gold, but they started betting on the good times continuing so they borrowed more and more money but eventually what actually happened and we've probably hit in a bit of a seed of demise here all about what 50 years ago mm. but still it's when you had more money printing around than you actually had gold and then they actually went to the new monetary system of course and that's where a fiat currency where your cash wasn't tied to gold whatsoever and your cash isn't really tied to anything that's right similar to what the dutch 400 years earlier when they realized oh shit we printed too much money that there's more money than there is actual gold even though the piece of paper used to say you know turn this in you get some gold back in return all of a sudden nixon saying you know what <laughs> that bit of thing that said you can get gold yeah no nah, it's just paper now so since then, there was actually a radical uh, burst in, in GDP and inflation and interest rates. So a bit of an economic cycle, mini economic cycle in there, but didn't really smack uh, the US as being the reserve currency of, of the globe. But they were planting some seeds of, of pot a potential demise. So now fast forwarding to 1990 to 2008, we're in a pretty different place today. As we saw, when a country gets to the top and people 
start to sit on their hands a bit and start to enjoy the finer things in life. Then you can see that machines and workers in other countries are going to replace the middle class. So the middle class who are kind of expecting a bit too much money per hour, they're expecting to work a lot less. All of a sudden, you've got hungry countries on the way up that are willing to work harder for less money. Um, and especially you, you saw in China, massive explosion in competitiveness and exports. Yeah, well, it's a bit like the Dutch when they were at the top. They didn't want to go out there and build ships. It's pretty hard work down there. Let's go and get those Brits to come and do it. Yeah. But in doing it, you're really training them up and uh, making them technological leaders in the next wave. That's right. How many things do you turn over and see made in China? Almost everything. everything. <laughs> Almost everything. And even immigrants coming. Well, we're in uh, Australia being situated in Asia. Anyone who's coming from other surrounding countries, mate, they're so hungry and they just start uh, and they're doing a lot of the hard work um, to keep us afloat, you could say. That's right. And what the uh, the Fed did in the US, um, this new thing called quantitative easing, they started buying financial assets, which drove up stock prices, it drove up profits, but that money didn't really trickle down proportionally. So you're seeing the largest wealth gaps since that 1930 to 1945 period. So the Dutch also, they bought all the shares in, uh, so the public funding went into the private um, equity market, so buying the Dutch East India Company. But then eventually everyone sort of catches up. That cash they're printing to just buy anything, it's not really worth much. So all that cash which is floating around the world, it can start floating back and devaluing that primary currency. At the same time this is going on, you've got the political gap growing as well. Um, you've got increasing extremism on both sides of politics. And now probably the, I guess the, the biggest thing Ray's saying here is that Following, you know, all these studies of history, he says that the U.S. is around somewhere between seventy to ninety percent through its big cycle. He says it hasn't crossed that line into civil war or revolution uh, yet, but internal conflict is high and it's rising. Which brings us to perhaps today. So we've spoken about U.S. getting to the very top, and we've spoken a little bit about the seeds of the demise. Mm. Now we're going to talk about the next big power which might be coming in, which of course is China. China has a, a strong culture and strong you know, unwritten rules that everybody agrees to around how communities and families should behave, around how leaders should lead, followers should follow. It's evolved over thousands of years through the rise and fall of many ruling dynasties. I guess they've gone through a whole bunch of, if we're talking the big cycle on the international scale, China's gone through a whole bunch of mini cycles uh, on their own thing with dynasties rising and falling. And they've kind of now got an established sort of order in place. Ray says we can fall into a trap of just like dismissing them as communist China because communism, it got its ass kicked a few times in the 20th century and you just put China in that bag of just another communist country who it's an economic system that won't work. But according to Ray and probably people who think like that, I almost guarantee they haven't been in China. If you read Ray's books, he spent a lot of time in China trying to understand them and he believes that throwing them in the box is totally wrong. That's right. Is you know as as we said that at the start that he's got uh, his main determinants or the factors that he judges education competitiveness innovation technology trade economic output military financial center status reserve currency status that's how he's judging um, country strengths and so he's betting his money that China's the next one on the on the rise in the big cycle now I reckon that's it's probably a dollar oh one bet he's not <laughs> he's not saying anything too drastic that. Nobody else was saying, but according to he's some, gone chips in. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone chips. You got him at a dollar one. You reckon? <laughs> well, it's pretty of- low. That's uh, like North Melbourne versus. No, I won't go there. <laughs> but so he's put like um he because he, he does rate all these things and put it on a graph, so it's somewhat objective. You could probably like tweak the inputs to just arrive at the outcome you want anyway. But oh, yeah. that aside, he says that China is now roughly on all these measures uh, tied with the US in being the leading power in things like trade, economic output, innovation and technology, um, and quickly rising in military and educational power. It but hasn't, I heard, yeah, I heard it hasn't, somewhere um, that on TikTok, for example, we're just like flying around on TikTok like it's <laughs> fun. Dances and shit. Their yeah. things they actually have, rather than just ads that make you buy shit you don't need, they actually have educational ads oh. implanted everywhere over social media for kids. So, they have That's to smart. learn. That's smart. <laughs> that's that's definitely a better thing than ads just to buy random shit that you don't need. But yeah, so out of those eight factors, he's saying China's pretty much equal in four of them. They're rising quickly on two of them. And there's two that they're not quite there yet, but he can foresee in the future that they could get there. There's also a difference that they look at naturally in the timeline of, of history and the actual 
um, what's that bias, Ash, for the short-term thinking? Short-term bias? Short-term bias, something like that. <laughs> I'm sure there's a better word for it. But sure obviously, it obviously, if you actually can invest longer in the future and have a longer-term yeah. horizon, it's going to be gratification? more gratification? That's the one, Ash, Joe. That's the yeah. one. But at the um, geopolitical level, most Americans believe their history is about 300 to 400 years old. And they're yeah. talking about some dude 300 years, 200 years ago. That's ages ago. That's <laughs> the beginning of history. And that's it. And, and China's just laughing, thinking, ha, 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 this is basically last year for us. You know, 300 years is nothing. You know, they're talking in, in you know, multiple millennia, even thousands of years. They're not talking in, in a small number of hundreds of years. They're also different in terms of their philosophy. So, they're big on Confucian, Taoist, Marxist philosophies, and they've got a big influence on Chinese thinking. Uh, whereas for the American history and say Westerners in general, it's about Judeo-Christian or European philosophical roots. And because of these, the the Chinese planning horizons, they're they're planning in in, in centuries. You know, they've got a hundred year plan that was put in place in nineteen forty nine, and they've got the hundred year plan going through to twenty forty nine. I don't know. It's, That's crazy, isn't mate, it? We don't have. Do we have a one-year plan? Well, we've got political cycles. If you're going, if you're in a new government coming in, you got. We need to kick ass to get That's votes right. in three years. That's right. The, the, no one's planning. Hundred. What years. are we going to do in hundred? And they've got. And more more important than just you know saying oh in a hundred years we're going to do this is they've got like the mini plans as well. They've got like five-year cycles where they're actually not just saying this is what we hope to do, but they're actually tracking. Are we on track to achieve these things? And what do we need to do? Yeah, I remember like this is close at home to us again, but like uh, Dan Andrews, when he had like a 2050 sort of railroad project, he got mocked. <laughs> like the whole populace yeah. like, oh, it's, it's 30 years ago. Why would you right. do something as stupid? It's, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be old. I'm, I might not be here alive. Like what's the point of planning that long? So that's just our yeah. natural bias for short-term thinking. That's right. It's a very different, uh, very different setup, um, how China plans versus how the West plans. So as classics in periods of prosperity um, at the top, the, the leaders financing debt bubbles and uh, large getting those large wealth gaps and you have uh, huge issues because of that and the era of peace and prosperity and globalization power it starts to begin to wane. Now, again, in terms of licking lips, it's been Xi Jinping and he's managed it quite differently. The goal is, I think I, I think I saw the goal is to what, have double the US but more evenly distributed um, and what they've been doing to achieve that is managing debt growth more flexibly managing the currency, supporting entrepreneurship and market-oriented decision-making, um, especially in industries that China wants to lead the world in. They're establishing some regulations and really really they're building capabilities and technology for the future. So that's what always happens when you've got a rising superpower and uh, versus someone who's at the top. Um, there is always the risk of a hot war, a hot military war, and we need to be able to avoid this because it's really just a choice between accepting and tolerating or even respecting the other's right to do what they think is best. And they're coming from totally different um, paradigms, aren't they? Because the alternative then is to not understand and accept and just fight to the mm. death on the values that That's you right. think are uncompromisable. That's right. Saying I'm right, you're wrong, you're going to do it my way. That's definitely the shortcut to war. The, I suppose the only saving grace which is a weird sort of saving grace, is that both China and the US for the foreseeable future are going to be powerful enough to inflict unacceptable harm on each other, as in there's mutually assured destruction. So basically, the only thing uh, keeping them from destroying each other is the fact that they can destroy each other. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, well, it's a big one, isn't it? Massive, Throw yeah. Throw a nuke, nuke back, everyone's done. That's right. But it, So, in terms of having something, a belief that's uncompromisable, unfortunately, there is one and uh, Ray is talking here about what the US and China believe about Taiwan. So, US, the US and the Western countries in general believe Taiwan is a sovereign country in and of itself. China believe uh, that Taiwan is still a part of China because historically it actually was a part of China as was Hong Kong. They made the move on Hong Kong, took that over and Taiwan is a part of it. So, if you just spoke, go to the local cafe in China and just ask, they don't know what Taiwan is. They think that's China. Is that right? Yeah. There you go. And Ray's saying, look, it's probably doubtful that the US is going to hold so strongly that it's going to lead to major war. Uh, as in, you know, China's so strong on it. You know, if you think on, on game theory, if one's extremely strong and one's moderately strong, probably the extreme one's going to 
going to win and the moderates just going to let it happen. But he's saying there is a chance that really over the next 10 years, that's really the only trigger for a big, massive war between US and China is if the US says, no, we're going to fight to defend this. Well, it's pretty scary, man. Since reading this book, I've just looked up a little bit on this. But yeah, China is flying a lot more military planes through Taiwan's airspace, which I believe they've done a few times in the past. Um, but because the US has been so much stronger than China... The US has sent their warships over there and just done a big flex uh-huh. and then trying to get back into their bubble. And so that's happened twice Jeez. before. Now, China are doing it a third time. They're just Oof. flying into the space. But, you know, now you're comparable at the same strength. Do the US go over there and just do a big flex? Or are they, or <laughs> yeah. is, it's a bit different, right? When you're 22 years old bullying a 14 year old, but that 14 year old finishes <laughs> puberty, yeah. does some weights. <laughs> And they're 19 and they learn how to do boxing and kickboxing. Mm. And uh, you've been sitting there drinking beers. Mm. What are you going to do now? That's right. <laughs> so, we didn't end on a wah, 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 wah. It's still, a, it's still an open <laughs> it's book un- there, isn't it's it? It's unsure. It's unsure um, what happens next. But as, as Ray is saying, you know, the, the big cycle, it's happened many times throughout history. And he's saying that based on all the, those indicators that he uses, he can see what's starting to happen now as well. The big one is that there's, and this probably goes against our belief and mine anyway before reading this book, that look, no system of government, economic system, currency, empire, it lasts forever. Mm. It's never going to last forever. But at the same time, you're going to be shocked as hell and surprised when that empire or, or reserve currency or whatever um, demises and fails. Mm. But if you look at history, it's actually not a big deal. And it's almost, it's actually inevitable. It's going to happen. That's right. Because we only know our lifetime, we only know the last handful of decades, we're assuming that the next handful of decades is going to be pretty similar. But if you're able to scale that thinking out to a couple of hundred years, then you can start to see that this shit happens all the time. Been over a year now since we wrote our first book, The Shit They Never Taught You. A uh, lot of fun writing it. And, uh, mate, looking back retrospectively, uh, we've been getting some phenomenal feedback from those who have been buying the book, and it's been quite impactful for everyone. We've got a great one here from Al Bortz A. Nice summary of lots of books. If you are a non fiction reader, this book can actually help you to better shape the overall understanding of your mindset. It's like the final touches on a vase during pottery. It doesn't create the main shape, but it smooths the edges. It can also help in creating some connections between different books which weren't possible before. But again, to make that main mindset structure, books need to be read and get reflected on. No one gets fit watching an exercise videos. That's a Jeez, that was pretty man. deep. Where, um, that was super deep. Where was that from, review? I've never heard Al Bortz. Where was it? All, do you know where it was? That was on, on the Amazon? audio book, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thanks, Al. That was one of my favorite, favorite <laughs> reviews so far. I like the deepness of the, the pottery vase, not creating the shape, you're smoothing out the edges, creating connect. Incredible. <laughs> well, if you want to create a, a vase full of connections and pottery of knowledge, then uh, this book, of course, is for you, the shit they never taught you. So if you want to get it for yourself, you can get the written version or the audio version, head to the shit they never taught you.com.